We're winding down our Heritage Month celebrations with just a few more days before we close out October. As we reignite the common themes of patriotism and cultural appreciation that runs throughout this period, we're interweaving elements of our heritage in Jamaica Magazine right throughout the month. I'm Theodore Henry and I'll unfold the details for your entertainment and educational needs right after the news. <laughs> Good day, I'm Stephen McHugh and this is your JIS News for Wednesday, October 27. Face-to-face -face instructions will resume on November 8 for certain categories of students. Prime Minister Andrew Holness made the disclosure during Tuesday's sitting of the House of Representatives. We are doing this knowing, conscious, that reopening and sending our children back to school could also cause the numbers to increase. There is no perfect and easy solution. So we believe we can manage the risk of outbreak by strategically allowing some children to go back and putting in place a measure that allows vaccinated students where vaccines are accessible. At the primary level, 45,390 students and 2,520 teachers will return to some level of in-person teaching and learning weekly. 376 of the country's 759 primary schools have been selected for physical lessons. 191 of the participating schools have enrollment of less than 100 students, while 185 have a school population of 630 students or less. At the secondary level, students in grades 11 to 13 are to return to prepare for external exams. Prime Minister Holness says the Ministry of Education will issue further advice on the schools selected and their ranking based on risk. He's calling on parents, school administrators and ancillary staff to get vaccinated. We make a special appeal, especially to those who have comorbidities, get vaccinated. Because you will be working among children who are, some of them, most of them will be unvaccinated and may have the virus and not show any symptoms. In fact, 90% of them will not show symptoms. No movement days have been discontinued and replaced with a standard 8 p.m. curfew start time seven days per week. The announcement was made by Prime Minister Andrew Holness in Parliament yesterday as he updated the House on the COVID-19 containment measures. Between October 29 and December 10, nightly curfew from Monday to Sunday will begin at 8 p.m. and end at 5 a.m. the following day. We will reconvene our Cabinet's COVID subcommittee to review these measures in three weeks' time. And depending on the level of increase in our vaccination rate, and the continued decrease in the positivity rate, then we could come back with even better news. Measures that remain the same for the five-week period are the gathering limits for funeral and burials, public gatherings, worship, weddings, annual general meetings, and public body events. These events that are held by public entities are to be controlled events, meaning that the space within which the event is kept, all the protocols must be observed, but it is not a free access space. And the reason for that, Madam Speaker, is that attendance at these events must be for the vaccinated only. Prime Minister Holness says the existing work from home directive will remain in place until December 9. However, as a precursor to returning to work, permanent secretaries and heads of agencies must put measures in place to ascertain the vaccination status of staff to facilitate risk assessment and planning. Consultations will be had with interest groups, including the Leader of the Opposition, to decide procedures for the Christmas period. And still in Parliament Tuesday, Prime Minister Andrew Holness announced the removal of travel restrictions on all countries that were banned due to their high COVID-19 infection rate or risk factor from new variants. The disclosure follows recommendations from the Ministry of Health and includes Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, Chile, Paraguay, Peru, India and Trinidad. 
Mr. Holness says the country's high vaccination and low virus transmission rates also influenced the decision. The Prime Minister was quick to add that the testing requirement for persons traveling to Jamaica remains in place. That is, a negative COVID-19 test taken within three days prior to travel. He also revealed that the travel authorization process through the Jam COVID and Visit Jamaica platforms have been overhauled. Jamaican passport holders and tourists now obtain expedited approvals within minutes of submitting their application, provided no COVID-related risks are identified. Permanent residents and work permit holders are required to upload documentary evidence of residency status in Jamaica following which approval is granted. Distribution of the second doses of the Pfizer vaccines should resume on Monday, November 1, as the country is expecting a shipment of 145,000 doses by the weekend. Health Minister Dr. Christopher Tufton made the announcement yesterday at a COVID-19 press conference. He says the doses are being received through the government of Suriname and a paid arrangement with the COVAX facility. We intend to commence distribution of Pfizer on Monday, November 1st, this is Monday coming. Um, once we get in, it's a matter of logging, um, storing slash distribution to the respective regional authorities. And uh, therefore that will take a day or two. Minister Tufton says the priority for the Pfizer vaccines will be for the over 85,000 Jamaicans waiting on the second dose of that brand and persons are encouraged to make their appointments on Thursday, October 28. The minister says over the next two weeks, he's anticipating that all persons due their second doses of Pfizer vaccines would have completed the process. Once second doses are completed, the intention, the policy as described by cabinet, I want to be very clear on this, is to administer the balance to our young people, our students, ages 12, to 18 years, um, they will be the one, not just given priority, they will be the ones who will be exclusively, who exclusively will benefit from the rest of the Pfizer vaccine. Additional doses of the Pfizer vaccine are expected to arrive in the country by early November. Up to October 26, 901,509 doses of vaccines have been administered, with 13.4% or 365,109 persons being fully vaccinated. And finally, the Ministry of Tourism has announced that TUI, the world's largest tourism company, has added Port Royal to its January 2022 schedule. Portfolio Minister Edmund Bartlett says TUI confirmed calls to Port Royal as part of its resumption of flights and cruises to Jamaica. TUI will also be home porting in Montego Bay. The company will provide five calls from January through to April 2022 in Port Royal. TUI has stated that Jamaica remains a safe destination with very low instances of COVID-19 transmission within the resilient corridors, as well as a very robust tourism workers vaccination campaign. And that's it for JIS News Today. I'm Stephen McHugh. Thanks for watching. The Government of Jamaica and its partners invites you to be part of the 7th Regional Platform for Disaster Risk Reduction in the Americas and the Caribbean, November 1-4. Tune into this station and watch the opening and closing ceremonies, as well as select sessions on the Ministry of Local Government's Facebook page, the JIS website and YouTube channel. Hear how the region is building resilient economies in the Americas and the Caribbean for you, for now and for the future. There's no one way to truly play the beat of our Jamaican culture. No one way to unfold the depth of the various movements that are intricately intertwined with the drums or whatever uniquely made instruments that accompany each other. And certainly, no one way to shake our hips, tap our feet, move our hands or dress to distinguish the truest form of our heritage in dance. But. There are certainly several ways to tell the island's tale of musical artistry and infectious rhythms. Today, we tell the story of the African retention in one of our Jamaican traditional folk forms, Gere. <laughs> Gere. 
Gere is one of Jamaica's more than 10 traditional folk forms that are mostly influenced by our African heritage and retention. Today, we take a close look at this work of art. To observe the fundamental rhythm of this artistry, we visited the award-winning William Nib High School in Trelawney. Gere is a dance of African origin that is usually performed the second night after the death of a person. The dance is very lively, flirtatious, and celebratory in nature, geared towards cheering the bereaved. I should tell you too that most of our traditional folk from the African retentions, ones, they are more similarities than differences. And the differences come sometimes in the songs, or the music instrument, or some of the steps. But there are more similarities than differences. With that said, the Gary dance is similar to that of Dinky Mini and Zella, with more emphasis being placed on the hippie movement executed mainly by the female dancers. The main movement for the ladies is the hippie movement, right? The hippie movement. And it's not a whiny, whiny movement. It's not a whiny, whiny movement. It's just a little hippie, hippie movement, like the mental movement. A little dip. All right? And for the males, you'll find them doing the, the not knee like the dinky mini. The movements, although vigorous, are very subtle. The males would maintain the knock knee position while exhibiting various styles and nuances as they execute their movement with subtle breaks towards their female partner, which is signaled by the drums. The music and songs are done in ring game style and often employ a call and response, which indicates the type of movement the dancer should do. So you have a caller and have the response. The group respond to it. Like all our other traditional folk forms, the Gary dance would not be possible without lively musical accompaniment. A host of instruments are used to bring life to the dance. In the Gary, you will see the rattle and the bass drum, which is a dominant to revival. But then the dominant thing in Gary that makes it different from Dinky Mini and the others is the pot cover. And that gives a nice sound. All right? As it relates to costume, Gary dancers are clad in the typical African retention dress code loose skirt and peasant blouse for the females, and a tailored pants and dashiki shirt for males. All of our African retention dances, traditional folk forms, they are done with 16 persons performing, and you have six others outside doing the singing and playing the, the instruments. Today, Gera is mostly practiced in the western end of the island, but you will also see it being performed as part of the annual JCDC Festival of the Performing Arts Competition. One thing is for sure, wherever it is practiced, one cannot help but notice that Gary has its own distinctive flair, which makes it a vital asset in Jamaica's rich amalgamation of cultures. It's absolutely critical that we receive the vaccines. You will see hospitalizations and indeed deaths likely come down. And so there is a lot of value to be gained 
by getting as many vulnerables on board as possible. So tell your mothers, tell your aunts, listen out for yourselves if you're over 60 and take the vax because the vax is what will help you to guard against the COVID virus and indeed help your relatives, your friends, those who you come in contact with for the same benefit. The Black River Morass is actually the largest wetland area in Jamaica. Um, the upper morass was uh, used for planting rice some years ago. That has ceased and uh, um, as a result, um, you know, we have lost that area. But the lower morass is still here and it provides not just a safari boat tour, but shrimping, fishing, and uh, there's a lot of bird life still in the lower morass. It has been declared a wetland of international importance, a Ramsar site. The Black River Morass is home to hundreds of crocodiles, vegetation and other aquatic animals. Through guided tours offered along the river, you can glide upstream to learn more about the wetlands and all its inhabitants. Welcome on board the Safari Diva and welcome to the Black River Safari. My name is Roger and I'll be your captain and also your tour guide. Our trip will take us approximately four kilometers upstream, during which I'll show you some birds, uh, wetland vegetation, and some of our very friendly crocodiles. Presently, we're on the Black River, and this is Jamaica's longest navigable river. It is 44 miles long, about 70 kilometer. Well, surrounding us, we have over 21,000 acres of swamp, and this is the largest wetlands in the Caribbean. It is also home for over 65 different species of birds. 17 years ago, it was estimated there was a little bit over 100 crocodiles living within the area. And since then, their number have increased as they are on the endangered species list. They were once hunted for their skin to make a nice shoes or a good handbag. But they are protected. No hunting of crocodiles in Jamaica. Well, they are part of our heritage. They are on our coat of arm with the crocodiles at the top, Indians at the side. Unlike what we may believe in Jamaica, our crocodile here, Crocodilus acutus, is one of the most docile of the crocodilian species. The thing about it is that they help to cull the fish population, the animals, the fish that are diseased or the fish that are dead, they will eat them and so on. So that it's well worth having those crocodiles here within our wetland areas. These birds you are looking at, they are called egret, uh, commonly known as galling. The reason for the birds to nest in this location, behind us, this is our local fish market. So once those small boat comes from sea, they'll have some food to get. In the river, we can catch big fish like tarpon. Those can get up to 200 pounds. And a snook, which is a very good eating fish, can get up to 50 pounds. And the African perch, mullet, snapper, several different types. It's very good for fishing. So by the shallow edge of the river, it is also the main habitat for our freshwater shrimp. This little device I have here, this is called a shrimp trap. It is made from the bamboo plant. We'll use for bait roasted coconut, oranges, or even a piece of chicken. Now once the shrimp goes in, it's difficult for them to go out. The conical shape helps to keep them in. So we'll just hold it and twist it. It opens up so we can shake them out. It's actually very simple, but it is effective. The design came from West Africa over 200 years ago, and it is still used today. 
The vegetation or trees, they are called mangrove, which we have two types of mangrove tree, white and red. White mangrove, small leaves and they are brighter in color. Red mangrove have much bigger leaves and also have those aerial root that goes into the water. It takes up all the minerals and nutrients for the tree. This section of the river we're entering, we call here Mongrove Avenue, as it forms a canopy similar to our Bamboo Avenue. These are all red Mongrove trees, the ones that have the roots going into the water. In the early 1900, the bark or skin of red mangrove was used for making a type of dye which we call tannin. Did you know that the water in the Black River is actually clear? The river got its name due to the dark shade created by the presence of peat soil on the riverbed. The peat soil, which is at the bed of the river that is giving off the dark reflection, uh, it also has its advantage and its disadvantage. The advantage, whenever time we have heavy rainfall, or during hurricane, the soil it acts as a sponge which absorbs the excess water so we have no flooding activity within the area. However, when the water level gets too low, the peat soil it gives off the methane gas and with the help of sunlight it will ignite. There are many different types of wetlands. In Jamaica, the most common wetlands are coastal mangroves, morasses, lakes and ponds. For more information on the Black River Morass and all the other wetland areas in Jamaica, visit the National Environment and Planning Agency's website at www.nepa.gov.jm. There are many natural elements that have long had a hand in shaping Jamaica's culture, like for example bauxite. The local bauxite industry has a long and rich story in Jamaica, and today we'll share the narrative in our next feature. Bauxite has been a stallion in the economic development of Jamaica from 1952, when the country made its first shipment of the product. Pulled from the womb of our earth, labeled as the rich red soil, though closely resembling a burnt orange or reddish brown color based on how your eyes see it. This precious mineral is conceived with the continuous fulfilled hope of bringing money, major investments, manpower, and however you put it, massive rewards to our island. Bauxite is the, the ore from which the metal aluminum is extracted. Uh, aluminum is a very, very important metal worldwide uh, because of the lightweight and the fact that it doesn't corrode as easily as iron. The first shipment of bauxite was out of Ocho Rios by Reynolds Jamaica Mines in 1952. A year later, Kaiser also began exporting bauxite out of Port Kaiser in St. Elizabeth and a number of other companies followed after that. Alcan um, set up their refinery at Kirkvine and were shipping bauxite out of Port Esquivel in 19, by 1954. Then the, the Alcoa plant at Halsall and the, the last refinery to be built was Nain, Alpart. Um, refinery at Nain. It was the beginning of the viable mining of the ore, and history tells us how its development filled the coffers of our small island home, or did it? Jamaica has been an important player in the bauxite industry since the 1950s. We were actually originally the, the largest producer. The important role of bauxite in our economy is the revenue that the, the country has earned over the years from the bauxite industry. Provide employment, we upgrade the work skills of our, our people so that we, we now have a lot of skilled workers in the bauxite industry. And there's a trickle-down effect on the economy 
because the more employment there is, the more spending power people have. In the 70s, the, the government began to play a more active role in the bauxite industry. So they began to acquire um, a piece of the action for, for the, the nation's benefit. And, and a levy was imposed in 1974 from which we benefited um, financially from production of bauxite. The, the government began to buy shares into some of these companies. Even though they were not the managing partners, we began to acquire a piece of the action for ourselves. The, the levy just allowed us to have a bigger piece of the pie. And while the production of the mineral was still booming, by 1974, the country had taken a small step back to become the second largest producer of bauxite in the world, just behind Australia. So Australia overtook us just by virtue of scale. It's a huge country with a lot of reserves and good quality reserves, easy to mine. In terms of production, we are ranked sixth in the world now behind Australia, China, Brazil, India and Guinea. So our production is in the region of about 10 million tons um, per year and we are comparing to Australia that's producing in excess of 80 million tons. We have some challenges that they don't, that these other countries don't have. For example, we are always mining in populate, populated areas. So our industry has to always be mindful of the local communities and find ways to work with them in order to continue producing bauxite. But despite that, the commercial mining of bauxite continues to be one of the most important contributors to the economic development of Jamaica, accounting for about 10% of gross domestic product, GDP. In addition to that, the industry represents one of the largest gross earners of foreign exchange for Jamaica. As long as human beings require resources, they will try to extract it wherever they can. Uh, the consumption of aluminium is going up, so I see as long as we have reserves available here, I expect that mining will continue. For at least the next 30 to 40 years, we should have enough reserves to continue at our present capacity. It is Global Media and Information Literacy Week being observed under the theme Media and Information Literacy for the Public Good. Here are the facts. The proclamation of this week is intended to help address the spread and proliferation of disinformation and misinformation. Also, the week is to help citizens develop the skills to critically analyze and use media and information. The idea for the declaration of Global Media and Information Literacy Week within the United Nations system was first proposed by Jamaica's Minister of Culture, Gender, Entertainment and Sport, Olivia Grange. The proposal was, however, previously accepted by UNESCO's Executive Board and by its Commission on Communication and Information. You too can be a part of this observance by sharing factual information, encouraging literacy and using social media platforms to create more awareness around the week. Achieving global media and information literacy will take us a step closer to making Jamaica the place of choice to live, work, raise families, and do business. Thirty minutes, just like that. But our rich cultural legacy continues and is ever growing and expanding, and you're encouraged to join in helping to create history. We want to thank you as always for spending this time with us. If you'd like a refresher, that's easily accessible through the GIS's YouTube channel. And while you're online, visit our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter pages for more information. From all of us here at the GIS, I'm Theodore Henry. See you soon. This has been a production of the Jamaica Information Service, the voice of Jamaica.